And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. All right, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 2, looking at verses 5 and 6. 5 and 6. It starts out with the word for, so we're going to have to find out what that's there for. But uh, we'll get to that. Verse 5, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. There is one God... And one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For there is one God. Before I said God desires us to pray for all men. He desires for all men to be saved for... There is one God and one mediator. So why is the fact that there is one God and one mediator tied to the fact that God desires all men to be saved? The answer in part is that if there were other gods, it might not be too important. If God is just one of many gods then uh, maybe you could do it whatever way the other God thought would be good. Instead of being saved, as God refers to it in the scriptures, maybe there'd be some other way. Perhaps the God they call Jehovah, who has no son, would be able to take care of us if there weren't only one God. But there is only one God, and he has a son, Jesus Christ. Perhaps the God they call Allah, and they say is the only God. Perhaps if he were even a God, then it would be so important for us to be saved, because Allah might take care of us. That's a scary thought from what we've been seeing, but... Maybe. Perhaps Buddha would take care of us if there weren't just one God. Maybe all the gods of the Hindus could be called in on the project. But no, there is one God. There is one God. Now somebody might be concerned that that's... Uh, the questionable with reference to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If there's only one God, how can there be a Trinity? But this is not talking about one in terms of the Trinity. It's talking about one as opposed to all others. There is one God. We must be saved. We must be forgiven because we've all sinned whom we sinned against, the one God. We all must be, we, we must all of us be reconciled. Have to be reconciled because we're alienated from God. How do we get alienated from God? By our sin, exactly. We all must be regenerated because we lost our original generation in the Garden of Eden, death came upon the human race, and it's been passed on to everyone since. And now to have life, we must have regeneration. We must have regeneration from that one God. We must be born again, because we need to have life. We must be born again, because there's one God, there's only one. There's no other way to go about it. 
We must be sanctified. We don't qualify. We must be justified. Because we don't qualify with that one God without it. We must be glorified because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There is one God. We must have fellowship with that one God. Only those who are in fellowship with him are going to enjoy his benefits. When we have fellowship with that one God, we have life. Isn't it interesting the way the Bible speaks of it just as life? We want to distinguish life and eternal life. But oftentimes the Bible just speaks of it as life. Either you've got life or you don't have life. And the life it's talking about is the life which goes on forever. It is eternal life, but it's spoken of just in terms of having life. And we have life because we have fellowship with that one God. Because we have fellowship with that one God, we have peace. We have peace with God, and the peace of God keeps our minds and hearts by Christ Jesus. Only when we are in fellowship with the one God do we have prayer promises. He promises to hear and answer the prayer. He insists that we call upon him, and he stands ready to answer our prayers. He is the one God. Only when we know that one God are we assured of protection. Assured of protection. He's watching out for us. He is caring for us. Only when we have fellowship with that one God are we promised a golden age. Looking forward to a golden age. An age that is far better than anything we've known. And by the way, in my lifetime, it's been headed in the other direction. How about you? Yeah, it's been headed in the other direction. But I know there's going to be a day when everything is better. We won't be hearing about some new disease every so often. It's going to be a golden age. We won't be hearing about some new name of a terrorist organization who's killing people. Because it's going to be the golden age. And that's because we have fellowship with the one God. There's only one. You've got to deal with him. No other options. Only when you have fellowship with that one God are you going to get to see the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. John says he saw it and it was coming down out of heaven. And it was 1,500 miles wide. It was 1,500 miles long. And it was 1,500 miles high. Won't that be something to see? New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. I'm saying, thinking that's big enough that you couldn't miss it. That, that's it, ginormous. Is that a word? It'll do. Only when we are in fellowship with that one God are we going to see our loved ones again. Those who have died in Christ we will see again because there is one God and he's in control of it all and he won't flub. He won't mess it up. He'll get it all done. It is possible for all men to be saved because there is one God. There are no conflicting gods. There's no other God that has a different plan, a different organization. But all men are related to that one God in the way that that one God provides salvation. All men can be saved. God desires all men to be saved, for there is one God. God desires all men to be saved because there is one mediator. There is one God, and there is one mediator. If there were other mediators, being saved would not be so crucial. This being saved that we have in the scriptures is all related to one mediator. 
You, you, there's no other game, there's no competition. You come to God through the one mediator. If you don't come through him, you don't come at all. Being saved means being delivered by the work of this one mediator. It's not just what he does, it is who he is. He is the sacrifice that made propitiation for our sin. This one mediator makes the propitiation. And there's only one because only one could make the propitiation for our sins. He is the intercessor at the right hand of the Father. If you could look at heaven right now, you could see God the Father on the throne and you could see Jesus Christ at his right hand and he's He's a busy savior. You know what he's busy doing? He's busy making intercession for all the sins of all the saints all over the world. You see why I say he's busy? He is busy indeed. Now I don't mean to imply that it's a challenge to his capacity because his capacity is infinite. But still, he's doing an awful lot in making intercession at the right hand of the Father. To have other mediators, we'd have to have other ways to God. Perhaps we could work our way to God. Be another mediator, and he'd say, well, you know, if you work hard enough, if you do the right things, if you do more good than you do bad, then you're going to be able to make it. That would have to be a different mediator, because this one mediator doesn't agree with that at all. He doesn't have that idea, never had that, that thought whatsoever. If Jesus, the sacrifice, is unnecessary, there's not just one mediator, his sacrifice isn't essential, because you could use another way. You could use another mediator. He is the sacrifice. Maybe we could become gods. Hmm? If he weren't the one and only mediator between God and man. Perhaps Mary, the mother of God, could mediate for us. Hmm? I mean, you do realize that there are millions and tens of millions of people who think that Mary is a better mediator than Jesus is. It's blasphemous, and I don't mean to suggest that's true in any stretch of the imagination. But the reality that in that which is known as the Christian church, there are Millions and millions of people who think that Mary is a better mediator than Jesus Christ. Why? Oh, because Mary is so tender-hearted, a mother's love, you know. And Jesus wouldn't deny her anything. But you see, Mary is not a mediator at all. Because you know what? There is one mediator between God and man. It says so. Where does it say it? Right here in the book. Right here in God's word. There is one mediator between man and God. If there were no mediator necessary, if we didn't need one mediator, then maybe we could just go directly to God. Maybe he would just overlook our sins, not require a sacrifice. Maybe he'd let us into heaven with our sin. How about that for a plan? The thing wrong with that is that we'd mess it up just like we got the world messed up. Before very long, we'd be right back in the same kettle of soup that we're in now. No! There is no other mediator. We do need a mediator. There is one mediator. One mediator between God and man. He's the only way to God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins.
Your sins will not be forgiven without the shedding of blood. Some blood has to flow. Some blood has to flow. Well, the blood of an animal will get it done. The answer is no. The blood of an animal will not get it done. It takes the blood of a man to get it done. How many men do we have as candidates to be the one to shed the blood so that we can have forgiveness? There's just one candidate. Jesus Christ is the only one. There is only one mediator, and he is the sacrifice to make propitiation for our sins. Is there anyone else as compassionate as Jesus Christ? His compassion is displayed when he leaves his throne in glory and comes down to the earth. His compassion is displayed when he touches the leper. His compassion is displayed when he touches the eyes of the blind and makes them to see. His compassion is displayed when he goes to the cross. His compassion is displayed when he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. He died alone for you and me. Is there anybody as compassionate as Jesus Christ? No. No, no there's no, no one who comes close, much less greater. Jesus Christ is the one mediator. And it is, it is the man, Christ Jesus. It's the man. Now, that's not emphasizing his maleness. Different word for man in the Greek. That's emphasizing his humanness. He is part of mankind. It is the member of mankind, Christ Jesus. That's what it's saying here. He understands completely being one of us. And he understands God completely being God the Son. And therefore, he is the one who's qualified to be mediator. He is mediator for the entire human race. He's not mediator for the white folk. He's not the mediator for the black folk. He's not the mediator for the Arab. He's not the mediator for the American. He's the mediator for absolutely everyone, not for one individual part of the human race. God desires all men to be saved, for there is one mediator. He's provided the way for everybody by making one mediator. Do you know that we're like the fallen angels in one way? The human race started out without sin. God made us perfect, innocent. God made in it angels the same way. The angels fell into sin, and we fell into sin. So we're like angels in that regard. But the angels have been left in alienation. They're alienated from God. Were they alienated by? By their sin. We're talking about the fallen angels, not all of them. But the fallen angels are alienated from God. They can't make it back. They can't get into fellowship with Him because they're fallen and there is no mediator. They don't have a mediator. They don't have a propitiation. God's not obligated to make a propitiation for them, is He? He's not obligated to provide a mediator, or he would have, but he didn't. And there is none. And the angels have no way back. But you know what? That's where we differ from angels. We have one mediator, and they don't. Wow! God was not obligated to provide a mediator for us. He did it in love. Now, was he the God of love when he didn't provide one for the angels? Yeah, he still was the God of love. He was the same. God is love. And love, being a God of love, did not require him to make a mediator for the angels. 
But he did for us. And he could have skipped the whole thing. He could just let us go to hell. But he didn't. And that's marvelous. We must be thankful that he has provided us with a mediator. God desires all men to be saved, for he has provided us himself, one God, and his son, one mediator between God and man. Let's think about that mediator for a moment. Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. A ransom. People who need a ransom are in a bad place. Some people were ransomed from prison in Iran recently. They were in a bad place. They needed a ransom, and a ransom was paid. Some prisoners were released in a deal. They became the ransom for those prisoners in Iran. Suppose they're glad about that? I'm thinking they are indeed. Eleven days ago, Ken and Jocelyn Elliott were abducted from their home in Burkina Faso and held for ransom. And they are today still held for ransom. And their government is the Australian government. And the Australian government has a policy. And their policy is no ransom. And Ken and Jocelyn Elliott are in for what looks to be a very long ordeal. Because there is no ransom. And you and I would be in for a very long ordeal ordeal if it wasn't that Jesus Christ is himself the ransom for our sins. Aren't you glad God doesn't have a no ransom policy? Amen. Yes, amen. We were captive to Satan because we sinned and we earned the death penalty. We believed his lie. He deceived us and we were inexorably moving towards hell breath by breath. Moment by moment, day by day, we were just a little bit closer to that time when we could not possibly be ransomed. Someone had to die for our sin. And Jesus Christ himself gave himself as a ransom for us all. Amen? Amen? Amen. And Jesus Christ is the testimony given at the proper time according to our text. The testimony given at the proper time. Jesus giving himself for a ransom was the testimony. Giving himself as a ransom was a testimony. It testifies to how serious our problem was. So serious that the very Son of God had to be given as a ransom. Nobody in the entire universe but the very Son of God could be the ransom. That's quite a testimony to how serious our sin was, isn't it? He's the testimony. He testifies that God desires all men to be saved. His desire was so great to have all men be saved that he was prepared to give his only begotten son to die on the cross a cruel death to give us the ransom that we needed. He is the testimony not only how serious our problem was and that God desires all men to be saved, he's the testimony that God will not withhold any good thing from us. He didn't withhold his son to be a ransom. There is nothing more precious to God the Father than God the Son. And he did not withhold him 
but freely gave him up for us all. He's already given the greatest gift. If there's anything less we need, do you think he's going to hold out on that? No, because he already gave the greatest. He showed what his love is. It was the testimony at the proper time. He gave himself a ransom to be a testimony at the proper time. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. It was when other things had failed that he gave his son a ransom. Man innocent in the Garden of Eden had failed. Man living free without the law outside the Garden of Eden had turned to violence resulting in the flood and had failed. Man under human government where the rule was that whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. That was a new form. That was a new rule. And man living under human government failed. Man under promise, a promise given to Abraham, a marvelous promise of land and of blessings and, and all the rest of it. He had the promises, he had privileges that other people on the earth did not have. He had all the prophets, he had the temple, he had everything and he failed. The Roman populace generally knew that all of their gods were useless. It was the proper time. Something was necessary. Everything had failed. Everything had failed. It was the time when Roman roads made travel all over the world. They populated the civilized world possible. It wasn't like our freeways, but for their time, it was pretty spectacular. It was a time when the Greek language, it's, yeah, I know the idea is it's Greek to me, but for them, you could go anywhere in the world and you could speak Greek and everybody would understand what you were saying. You didn't have to have a translator. If they didn't know your local dialect, just talk to them in Greek. And they'd understand what you were saying. It was the proper time. Proper time for Jesus Christ to become the ransom for all mankind. It was a time when the Roman Empire had established peace in all the territory it reigned in, in many, many nations all over the world. You didn't have to worry about being able to get across borders. They weren't at war at one another because Rome had made them all under the emperor in Rome. And you could go from country to country freely. For there is one God, God desires all men to be saved, for there is one God, and one mediator also between God and man. If you are going to get to God, you're going to have to come by the one and only mediator. He doesn't have any competitors. That mediator is the man Christ Jesus, he's a member of the human race as well as being God. He is the man Christ Jesus and he's the mediator between God and man. He gave himself as a ransom for all. A ransom has been paid, a price sufficient for your salvation. A ransom for all. Doesn't make any difference what language you speak. Doesn't make any difference what color your skin is. Doesn't make any difference what political system you live under. Doesn't make any difference what generation you're living in. Jesus Christ is the ransom for absolutely everyone. He's the ransom for all. 
and he's the testimony given the very fact of his sacrifice is the testimony that this is the way this is the only way and God loves us and God is offering a free gift through his son Jesus Christ and he was given at the proper time everything was ready people understood how everything else had failed and now the world was in a condition for the message to be spread and so he was given as a ransom and as a testimony at the proper time and because of that we have salvation we have everlasting life we're going to go on from this day forward and many days behind us we're going to go on from this day forward headed towards glory we're going to enjoy the blessings of God forever unfortunately there are still many 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 who do not know our Savior he gave himself a ransom for them too but they've not received it they need to know Jesus Christ and guess who knows how they can do that you do I do I think that God wants us to share the word he wants all men everywhere to be saved he wanted it enough that he gave his son he gave him as a ransom as a testimony in due time and now he's left us here and he's given us a commission and our commission is to go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature may God help us father thank you thank you for your love and for your plan thank you that there is one God thank you that there is one mediator thank you that he did give his life a ransom for all in Jesus name Amen